I just need to find a tripod so I can set up the webcam that I'm gonna use. I have two ring lights, because the camera's facing this way. My name is Justine Tiba. I am from the Pueblos of Santa Clara, Tsuki, and Acoma. Can we move the table over slightly? I am a member of the Red Nation, which is an indigenous liberation organization. All right. Welcome to the Red Nation podcast tour, guest hosted by Justine and Kaya in 2022. Uh, hi, everyone. It's Melanie, Melanie Yazzie, co host of Red Power Hour. This is one of my projects that I'm doing. This is the Red Nation podcast, podcast tour. <laughs> what we're doing is we're just gathering content for our podcast from various parts of the movement going on here in New Mexico. Okay, because what we, me and you got to record like ASAP is <laughs> we still got to record the introduction. We see the USA as a settler colonial project and are campaigning to take back what is rightfully ours. This land, our land, contains billions of barrels of oil and billions of cubic meters of natural gas. And US energy companies have been extracting it for decades. This has been extremely harmful to the environment and devastating to tribal nations. I just want to shed light on that because these are our ancestral lands that they're contaminating. And if we don't step up as the real relatives of this land, like, then who is? And how we, can we let it continue? In this podcast tour, we're going to meet indigenous land defenders who are reclaiming stewardship of the land from U.S. empire. Oh man, it's a hot one. It's a humid day. Wow. Sheesh. So right now for the podcast, I'm gonna open it up, give an introduction, and then after that, I'll let you just say anything you wanna say and I'll record you like this. I just would like to just emphasize that, you know, when you come up on the Pajarito Plateau, that first and foremost, this is Tewa Ancestral Homelands. We're here where they're producing nuclear, pit, pr nuclear pits, the core of nuclear bombs. And then there's also the communities on the waste streams. Um, just over those mountains is a nuclear waste dump. So just 20 minutes away from where I grew up, like I didn't even like know about this. I know about the atomic bomb, but only from like the perspective of like US imperialism you know, going to like school and learning about it and being like, fr learning from the perspective, like it's something to be proud of. And they'll tell you it's safe, but we know that the standards for radio radiological exposure in, the court, in this country are based off an adult white male. They're not protective of indigenous pregnant people. They're not protective of, um, young, of infants or elders. I think um, we should wrap up right there and go to the next site. People think about like environmentalism, like that word. They probably think of like Greta, you know, on the great ship crossing <laughs> the Atlantic Ocean, like a pilgrim of the 21st century from Europe. Um, right. They think about white protagonists. They think about white liberals, let's just be honest, or like NGOs or nonprofits. And it's not to say like that work isn't important, but actually like indigenous people and indigenous women on frontline struggles to protect water and land have actually like transformed, I think, the landscape of what we usually consider environmentalism. We should probably eat at some point tomorrow. Here in the state of New Mexico, this is one of the only states in the U.S., I think it's the only state in the U.S. that can produce nuclear weapons from start to finish. So from mining the uranium to the building of the actual weapon to the disposal of the waste and everything. And so we live in the middle of this like nuclear monster.
We're on our way to commemorate the largest radioactive spill in U.S. history, which happened on Navajo Nation land. We still want to do, like, if we can... Field like, interviews? Yeah, like, attendees kinds of, like, opinions. I do. No more than, like, 10-minute, like, interviews. Dota hydrogen! Dota hydrogen! Yucca! <laughs> Love you guys. We love you guys too. They are uh, like the most badass like youth organizers here in New Mexico. They are on the streets anytime something happens. Let's get the gist. Like, do you, what happened here? So about in the 70s, in the early 60s, 70s, um, the Navajo Nation was deemed a national sacrifice energy zone. And so throughout the Navajo Nation, there was a lot of extractive industry development happening throughout the reservations. We were not warned or told about the dangers until later about uranium. My mom was diagnosed with cancer before my dad was diagnosed with cancer. We know it's for uranium, radiation, exposure. I'm so fed up with the federal government for the way they, the way they treat us. I was born and raised here in this community. What do you want the people to know? So what I want the people to know is to really understand that nuclear energy is not clean. Look at all this devastation right from the very beginning. All these abandoned mines all over the Navajo Nation. All these impacted communities and they're all disenfranchised communities because they're all indigenous communities. It was a very intense day. There was multiple times throughout the day where I had to like stop and ground myself. That will make it to Cal for you too late. If you were stopping go, two hours at most. Sound good? Taking into account for how much time and travel things take is probably has probably been like the biggest challenge so far. Because we didn't anticipate how long things were gonna take, how hot the weather was gonna be, and um, how much traveling we were gonna be doing and, and how much energy that, that in itself was gonna take. I grew up here, I live on the outskirts, but everything we ever needed to get, whether it be food, just some simple supplies, we'd always had to come into Gallup to get those things. We like to refer to these places as border towns, not like bordering the U.S. border, but bordering reservations. It's places like Gallup, New Mexico, Albuquerque, Flagstaff, Arizona, Santa Fe, New Mexico. Gallup survives off the Navajo dollar, yet they don't really want us here, pretty much. When Jesus dictated these letters to the seven churches, the main source of revenue for Gallup, one of them was like tourism, and they love like putting putting the the stereotypical Indian culture, and they love putting that on like display for people. But yet, when you have the real thing right there, they kind of just hide you. It's just very predatory. It's exploitative. What sets settler societies apart from other types of colonialism is the transforming of land that indigenous nations uh, were stewards over into private property. Because of course you have to remove native people from the land in order to seize it, to claim it. And so, you know, what settler colonialism tells us is that native people are either completely disappeared and extinct or in a constant state of disappearing. Right now, we're at the Counselor Chapter House on the Navajo Nation. As we speak, I'm filling up a 250-gallon water tank in the back of my grandpa's truck. 
We're gonna go take this water to a garden that is at the site of a fracking spill. There is a gas well every tenth of a mile. You know, it's constantly emitting um, hydrogen sulfide. It's highly emitting toxic gases out of there. The toxic um, air is just like, it's, it sits and it stays. Here we had um, thousands of gallons uh, of, of wastewater, frack wastewater coming out from this facility here. Mycelium is a mushroom, a family-based mushroom, and it helps remediate the soil. Um, it cleans the toxins out of the soil. Would it be better to put it right here and no. then it'll float? It's pretty crazy um, how toxic it is. We have a lot of family members um, who have died on because of like stage four and they didn't know they had stage four. We're now looking into how can we have our own communal gardening space of traditional medicines and um, remediation plants to help um, our communities because as you can see here, we're in a desert, we're in a dry place. We can only network amongst ourselves, and I think that's where we'll find the solutions is through each other rather than relying on a system that wasn't meant for us. Yeah, it's looking good. Yeah, we shortened it to the 30 minute nice tight episode, and then you just release the whole thing, even with like some maybe jokes or just some stupid things we maybe think we shouldn't have said. Yeah. <laughs> and that can just go out unedited, It'd be I think. cool to like pull like really good quotes and really good bits and like try to like sew them together and like make like a, like almost like an audio documentary. Espanola, Espana. Northern New Mexico, it's my hometown. Let's head out. I feel like Española has always had a rep that it's like um, very impoverished. Um, there's a lot of drug use. It's like pretty racist too. I mean, all border towns are racist. The drug epidemic is so bad and intense and it, it gets worse every year. Personally driving around, like I feel, I call it like traumied out because um, we're driving next, we're driving past places where like I used to do heroin or I used to pick up heroin. I'm a former addict. Like here at the Sonic, one time I was with one of my friends and she OD'd in the Sonic parking lot. People become addicts because they're hurting. You know, people are hurting because they don't have the resources they need. They're hurting because they don't have the relationality that they need. Even me personally, just talking about like boarding school and how it like messed up generations of my family. And that's ultimately what I realized about my addiction was that like I was an addict because of the results of colonization. Like literally boarding school did this to me. We're on our way to a project that is resisting the damage that stems from being separated from our indigenous knowledge. Let's do a fisty fist. Right. Welcome everybody. We're at the Española Healing Food Oasis. Uh, this is a project under Table Women United. Cogwoods are our special treat. Um, here because it grows along the Rio Grande and there's a root system that talks to each other to other systems in the ground. You know, they provide us shade, a food source, medicinal purposes as well. It's grown here in this area and nowhere else in the world. Oh, okay. So if we end up losing these endemic species um, to extinction, they're never going to come back, most likely, unless we start harvesting seeds.
and wolfberry we used back in the day to grow next to corn because they actually act as a repellent to worms in their corn. Mm -hmm. That's how you know you're at an ancestral site is if you see them growing everywhere. <laughs> I'm embarrassed by how much I don't know. <laughs> okay, but right here, the top row is the red amaranth. It actually serves purpose for food, edible, and for dyeing. Yeah, amaranth was like outlawed at one point by like conquistadors. And yeah. like I heard stories of like the cut off your hand. Yeah, that's why I say this place is also pretty radical because we are growing plants that were once outlawed and they're, and people don't know now like that it was outlawed. It's also really delicious. During the pandemic, um, I think like, over 200 people came in to get seed to for their gardens, um, which is awesome because, you know, we weren't seeing a lot of people farming or gardening before the pandemic. I'm like really like happy like that this place like is a place of protection for people. Those mushrooms are like in this area somewhere. Oh. Just the banner would be good, right? Yeah. I got to put it on my bullhorn arm. We should probably take the cops or Indian Whoa. killers sign too, huh? Yeah. We're going to a defund the police rally and protest. This is a response to an incident involving the hey, Albuquerque Police down. Department in which a 14-year-old black boy was killed. No cops! No KKK! The Red Nation began no in 2014. It was a response to border town violence and police violence. Albuquerque has one of the highest rates of fatal shootings by police in the United States. Nationally, more Native people are killed by police per capita than any other group. Justice is our demand! It feels like the police have targeted us since the establishment of the United States to stop us from fighting for our land. Get this uh, city's dirty laundry. Let's air it out. It's blatant racism. Frankly, I'm exhausted from how much racism I've experienced on this trip. I didn't realize that going back to back, border town to border town, would affect me so much. And today was like the doozy. Um, I was straight up praying and being attacked. And so today, all we were doing, we just rolled into town. We hadn't been here for more than five minutes. And we were just stopping really quickly at the places where we lay down offerings to, you know, set out on a good day. On the second place we stopped, this uh, security guard cop, she just came barreling. She saw us drive into the parking lot. Driving while Indian, a DWI, that's what we were guilty of, guilty of this, this morning. I, sometimes I don't think people realize, like, the amount of violence that we experience doing the work. The women in the Red Nation have faced death threats, like we get trolled online constantly. Oh God, I just hate it here. I know. <laughs> Can you look up uh, Randy's address, please? Durango, Durango, what does it mean, do you know? Durango, I believe it means uh, where the white people come. <laughs> really? Where the gentrifiers go. Continue on County Road 214 for half a mile. <laughs> yeah, Randy's house is definitely over there. <laughs> All right, just overheating. Oh, Randy's ancestor oh was among many indigenous people forcibly relocated really? from their land. But Randy's ancestor refused to leave, so the fact that he's still here farming is an act of resistance. Can you tell us a little bit about where we are? Tell, what's, what's Weasel Skin Farms? What I wanted to do originally was to like 
you know, uh, go off grid or, you know, all that, blah, blah, blah. You know, everything, you know, all that toxic shit everyone talks yeah, about. I'm an individual person who can handle, yeah. hold my own. Yeah, exactly. And, like, that's where it all started. And once I started, like, engaging with people and started seeing, like, it wasn't all about oneself, you know? Like, mm -hmm. I know I couldn't do it without all my people. Go. Like the moisture, like using sheep wool to mulch has been like something I've been really into the past couple of years. And mm -hmm. it retains the water. If you like, we'll just dig it up. And you'll see it. Like you see it in hell. See, like there's mycelium growing underneath there. Like, see? Oh, hey, you see check that? that out. Yeah. I'm using what I have at hand. This is your method. Yeah, it's my method. There you go. I'm trying to open up these spaces and so our people can have somewhere to go because you can't go to a community garden if your community is a bunch of white people, you know? You can't interact with our relatives, these plants, if, you know, if you're uncomfortable. And, you know, that goes back to the access to land. This is the emerald field, this emerald and corn. So you just planted like a little patch over there and then the rest like did itself. Yeah. I let the plants go to seed last year, the emerald seed, so it, uh, the seeds just dropped everywhere. Like I dehydrated the leaves, like the because I had to thin them out, right? So I had to like dehydrate them. So I dehydrated them into like little chips. I also want to put tools and knowledge back into indigenous people's hands. All right, maybe we can uh, take a seat and talk a little more. Yeah. Okay, let's do that. Hello, hello, hello. Hi, welcome to. Okay. Welcome back to the Red Nation podcast, podcast tour. I also want to acknowledge the rain and the thunder. It's so beautiful. It's a beautiful blessing. I just want to ask real quick. Uh, oh, I just want to ask real quickly. Um, would you call what you're doing uh, food sovereignty? Would you say you're a part of that movement or is it just something like? Huh, I don't know like putting the power back into people's hands, I guess. So, yeah, you know, like, if you think about, I like to say this, about 80% of what I do and 80% about what comes off the land, what I forage and what I hunt, like, I don't keep, I don't capitalize off of any of these things, you know? What if we were too busy instead of actually thinking about what we're gonna do after these things, you know? Like, what's our aftercare program? As I like to say, after we get done uh, being on this drug of capitalism. Mm. Like, how are we going to, you know, that's just the way I always think about these things. So that's why I always want to, like, teach people and kind of, like, get things set up. Okay, building the foundation yeah. for post-apocalypse. An indigenous post-apocalypse, which really sounds like just the, like, beginning of the new world and a beautiful one. Mm. <laughs> like a world premise on indigenous values, kinship, and living in relation with land, gardens, and community, and like living in, that just, it just all sounds like living in a really good way, Randy. Mm -hmm. And that's what you're doing. You're building it. You're inspiring people, inspiring me, inspire the Red Nation. The United States is in climate debt to us, so the, not only do they owe us the land itself back, they also owe us the remediation of these lands too. Beyond that, what land back is, it's the reinstatement of stewardship um, to indigenous peoples over the land. All right, man, you ready for this? <laughs> Whew, all right, let's see. What color that showed up, so it was just the like- The audio is really good. I'm not an academic. I'm not crazy educated or anything. I'm kind of like nobody. But Red Nation gave me the revolutionary confidence to use my expertise as an indigenous woman in the world. Red Nation made me somebody, and Red Nation made me into a leader. This is day two, and today is a special day. We're with Beata Sosi Pena. She's going to tell us about, like, the nuclear contamination. 